name's Anna May, and I'm a forester in the Fourth Generation of the Archer family. The Starker Forest was started in 1936 by my great-grandfather, T.J. Starker, and it's been in the family ever since, joined my grandfather, Bruce, and my dad and uncle, Bart and Vaughn, and now me and my brother and a couple of my cousins are also involved in this. The Starker Lecture Series started as a way to honor T.J., as well as Bruce, because they're both really interested in forums for debate and new ideas and push. After they both passed away, the family thought it'd be a good way to carry on their legacy. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Cushing. I am the Starker Chair of Private and Family Forestry at the College of Forestry at Oregon State University. I want to start by acknowledging that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampinifu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. The 2021 Starker Lecture Series, Resilience in the Face of Disturbance, Learning from Disasters, focuses on how communities, industries, and organizations across the forest landscape have responded to recent and previous disasters, shown resilience in the face of adversity, and are ready to play critical roles in creating a better future. Today's topic is on economics. The COVID-19 pandemic and the 2020 Labor Day fires have had major economic impacts on Oregon's forest sector. Our speakers today represent small and large Oregon land and processing facility owners and a major forestry consultant. They will discuss the impact and how the Oregon forest sector is responding to them. SAF credits will be available for this lecture. During the Q&A, we will announce a keyword in the chat. Please send your full name, email address, and SAF or CF number along with the keyword to the email listed in the chat. After we hear from our speakers, we will have time for questions. So please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A feature at any time during the lecture. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Tyler Frares, Vice President of Sales for Frares Lumber Company. He has worked directly in plywood manufacturing since 2004. In his veneer sales position, Tyler is responsible for selling and sourcing all veneer for Frares veneer and plywood operations. As an executive team member, he takes an active role in determining the long-term direction of the company. He began his career in the, in the timber industry during his high school years when he held his first job cleaning grease out of logging equipment. After high school, Tyler attended Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, where he earned a BA in English Literature and a BBA in Business Administration with a finance minor. During his college years, Tyler returned to Oregon each summer to work in every available timber industry job millwright, dryer feeder, barker operator, green chain, core layer, log scaling, and road crew. After graduation from SMU, Tyler attended Oregon State University College of Forestry. He and his wife, Dina, then spent a couple of years in France. While abroad, Tyler worked on his MBA. In 2016, Tyler conceived of, and the company later created Frere's Mass Plywood Panel. Tyler's passion for the future of veneer is evident. I believe that the veneer and panel industry has the greatest potential of transforming and producing innovative wood products to create the greatest structures at the lowest cost with the least environmental impact. Please join me in welcoming Tyler. Thank you, Tammy, much appreciated. Is my screen up okay? So a little bit of background about Ferris Lumber Company. We were founded in 1922 by my grandfather, T.G. Ferris. Uh, we have always been in the San Am Canyon 
In fact, I'm a fourth generation Oregonian, but also a fourth generation Sanium Canyon resident. Um, we have really been in business for 99 years now, so we're pretty excited that this next year will be our 100th year anniversary. So uh, we're ant anticipating a big party at that period of time. We moved to Lyons from uh, the mill site that was up right in the middle of the forest in the mid 50s and transitioned from lumber producers to veneer producers at that period of time. So nowadays we operate two veneer facilities, a veneer, veneer drying facility in which we merchandise veneer to almost all of the West Coast producers of engineered wood products. We have a plywood facility. We have a cogeneration facility in which we're producing about 7.2 megawatts of electricity off of wood waste uh, after our parasitic load. A lot of the wood waste that we do take in is actually from urban waste as well. So we take in a lot of, of uh, urban material. We have a stud mill and we have a fleet of log and highway trucks. And as of uh, December, 2017, we have a one, of a one of a kind facility in the world where we make uh, mass timber panels entirely veneer based. So 2020 was a trial. I mean, I, I know it was difficult on everyone and we all were wondering when it was gonna end, but uh, between COVID and then locally, we were impacted by the Beachy Creek fire. Um, and then further to our east, the Lion's Head fire, but more locally, it was the Beachy Creek fire. In particular, uh, COVID has had very, very unique um, effects on us as a company. Just to give you a timeline of how 2020 went for us is uh, we were experiencing escalating markets in January of 2020, and it was really improving as well coming into February. But by the time that it uh, became apparent that COVID was a big issue for the country, uh, in March, our orders started to dry up and we ended up with uh, no orders going into March. We essentially produced all the way through March um, until we really ran out of space to put our product anymore. So we made as much as we could, we ran as long as we could, and then we physically ran out of space. Um, and that was by the end of April is when we, uh, we, when we ran out of space. So in the first week of May, we took in all of our facilities down for an entire week. Uh, by mid-May, the effects of the over shoulder, the shoulder trade is what they call it with people wanting to do deck improvements, home improvements and being available in their homes uh, started to improve the market conditions. So our market started to, to improve mid-May of 2020. But the largest impact that we've experienced from COVID has really been to our labor force. Um, obviously, the uh, everyone has been affected by this and no one wants to wants to uh, work in an unsafe environment. So we did our due diligence to try to establish as many different plastic barriers and face masks. We provided free face masks to all of our employees. Um, luckily in our type of industry, most people work in machine centers, so they aren't working on top of each other. And obviously uh, it was beneficial that we were considered an essential industry. So we weren't forced to shut down like many restaurants and uh, in other places around the state. So uh, I think the first, the main example of that is that, you know, one of the first things that, that grocery stores ran out of was toilet paper, which luckily we sell a lot of chips and residual fibers into the paper companies. But what it means for us in our workforce is that we essentially cannot have an attendance policy at, at the moment because if someone has a sniffle or if they have uh, childcare issues or if they have any other concerns around COVID, then essentially they, they can call in and, and not show up. So we have a very unpredictable attendance at our facilities right now. We don't know which machine centers we can run. Um, and essentially we, we're at about 60% of our production capacity. And that's, uh, that's kind of a sad thing to experience when you're also seeing some of the strongest markets that we've seen in the history of the wood products markets. But we have tried to do our best to take employees from other positions and try to cross train them into new positions so we can at least keep the essential elements of our mills operating at different times. We are currently trying to hire for about 50 positions. 
So if you know of anyone that's out of work, um, please send them our way. We would like to increase our workforce and increase our, uh, our employment here. And we have some very interesting positions nowadays with the new products we're making. So for 2020, we had experienced a 29% reduction in our total green veneer production and a 21% reduction in our plywood production. Uh, we make a very small amount of lumber, regardless of our name, that's not a huge portion of the business that we have right now. Uh, but still, our lumber portion experienced a 13% reduction. As of the beginning of 2021, we actually have most of our shifts operating again, although there are times where we just don't have enough people show up at one of our green, green veneer facilities that we need to shut down a shift or move people around in order to keep things operating. The, uh, the biggest tragedy for this region uh, occurred in September uh, in Labor Day this, this last year. It was the Beachy Creek Fire. So the Beachy Creek Fire uh, covered almost 200,000 acres. And here locally, uh, 700 homes were destroyed. We had five fatalities also, especially up on the, uh, the little north fork of the Sandium River. For us, uh, we had 15 employees who directly lost their homes in this fire. And uh, we had three weeks where our manufacturing plants weren't operational. I've got to say, this is one of the first natural disasters that I've, I've personally been through. And it was an extremely harrowing experience, uh, especially in the hours and days following the fire. Uh, we were personally evacuated from our home as well. So it was uh, very interesting. Uh, one of the amazing things about this fire was to see the rural community come together and come help each other survive this event. Even the day after this fire, people that lost their homes came to our mill sites and fought the fire on our properties in order to make sure that we actually survived this fire. So it was, a, it was an amazing thing to see a small rural community band together and really accomplish some amazing things. And the, uh, <clears throat> The other thing that, that was pretty shocking is the fact that, I mean, frankly, we didn't see any state or federal aid uh, in our canyon until probably a week or two after the event. Pretty much most of the fire mitigation around our facilities uh, happened by the rural communities, by logging crews, by foresters, even by local people that just had a, uh, had a trailer with a tank on it. It was a pretty amazing thing to see. So in this picture, you can see the extent of the Beachy Creek fire which was primarily to the north of our facility in Lyons and Mill City. Uh, the left picture within the, uh, within the red expanse, that is actually our plant facility. So you can see how close the fire came to, uh, to actually destroying our facilities. And every single one of our six operating facilities are right along this fire line. So we, we really have to handle it, hand it uh, a lot of grace and, and thanks to the local fire departments because they were there to really help. We provided free access to all of our, our fire pumps and all of our water sources in order to allow pretty much anyone across the area that was fighting fires to, uh, to get access to water. Um, after about two weeks, we did see some additional firefighter presence, and especially a couple of Canadian crews that came down and and we're putting out uh, root fires across the, uh, the Sanium River. And uh, the other thing that happens under a natural disaster, which I learned, is that you actually end up with a little bit of lawlessness. So we, there were several uh, instances of looters. Um, the Marion County Sheriff's Office secured the area pretty, uh, pretty quickly, but then after that, the National Guard arrived, and we were all very happy to see their arrival. So for us personally, uh, we had about 5,500 acres burned by this fire. We are not a large landowner. We are a small family uh, forest products company. So we have about 17,000 acres. That 5,500 acres uh, represents about 32% of our timber holdings. So it was a significant loss. And uh, that represents lands that are not, that were reprod uh, up to 30 years old but also up to our, our mature stands uh, that were up to 80 years old. The picture in the top right is actually our properties up next to the Jefferson. It was hit especially hard. 
we have not had uh, the significant um, opportunity to uh, survey those lands to see how, how badly they were affected. But uh, we estimate that our current loss from this fire is about $22 million. On the bright side, we have already begun salvage logging these properties to try and put them back into uh, forest production. Uh, in the fourth quarter of 2020, we took in about uh, 16 million board feet of timber off of uh, this local area in the, in the North Fork of the Sandy M. That, that 16 million board feet number surpasses what we typically consider to be our our annual sustained yield harvest of about 13 million feet. So unfortunately, we've been having to harvest a lot more timber off of this that was, was burned uh, during the fire. We anticipate that we will probably be harvesting another 15, billion, or 15 million board feet every quarter of 2021 until we can get our properties back into working order. But as you can see, we've already begun uh, replanting these properties. For the first and uh, for the last quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021, we anticipate that we're going to plant about 400,000 seedlings. And through 2022, we have 2.3 million seedlings on order and intend to go through an aggressive replanting of all of our burned property during that period of time. So there's a lot of things that the rural community thinks about an event like this. Um, this is a, the Sandium Canyon is a rural community that has always been dependent upon the, tim the uh, timber industry and about, uh, and its prosperity essentially depends upon the prosperity of the timber industry as well. So it is not lost on our rural community that when, uh, when our resources that are burned locally um, are lost, that there's a lost prosperity here as well. There's a lot of concern about how the fire started, um, the, in particular, the Opal Creek Wilderness had a fire about three weeks prior to this event, and it was a known fire that was smoldering in the forest. And there is a lot of question about whether or not the Forest Service or uh, the state agencies could have put that fire out prior to the extreme sustained wind event that we experienced on Labor Day. Uh, while majority of the Beachy Creek fire has been attributed to the growth of the Opal Creek fire, there is some talk about um, electrical lines causing fires down around Detroit and about Mill City and around Mill City that facilitated the fire growth. But as I said, this is a community that uh, that grew up on and experienced uh, the forest and the timber industry. So the lack of forest management that they've seen within our forest for the last two decades has been acutely on the minds of the rural community. And there's a lot of questions as far as how we're going to move forward on this event as well. For the private landowners, we're aggressively trying to rehabilitate and improve the quality of the forest that we saw burned during this event. Obviously, we're already replanting trees and seedlings to try and get them growing again. But will the state and the federal governments uh, try to restore the, their forests to the same event or to the same degree that the private landowners are? Uh, that's a big question to us, especially since the rural community understands how, how much uh, of their income and prosperity comes from these uh, the local resources here. And frankly, a lot of our rural community spends so much time recreating within these forests that are, that are here locally and fishing within our rivers. So the other question that we have is that as a private landowner within the Sandium Canyon that's aggressively rehabbing and replanting our, our lands in new seedlings, are we not, are we potentially setting, a, going through a huge expense to rehabilitate these lands? If the federal government and the state government don't do the same thing, are they not setting us up for the next fire by allowing a large amount of dead and dying trees um, on our properties that surround our forests. So we are currently spending what we anticipate to be about $7 million on just replanting these, uh, this acreage that we have, uh, we have burned right now. And we, we sincerely hope that that's not gonna be, be money unwisely spent just due to forest mismanagement in the future. 
in regards to how our community is making it out of this fire, it's uh, it's been a difficult experience for our community. There was a pretty good uh, immediate outpouring of financial assistance from uh, from everywhere around Oregon and really places outside the state. The St. Anne Canyon Wildfire Relief Fund has has just recently reached three million dollars of donations that will go to the local uh, local people who were impacted by this fire. But frankly, the uh, the actions of FEMA and the state um, has really slowed down the potential rehabilitation of, of these people. Um, so the state won't really spend any money until FEMA spends their money and FEMA won't really spend their money until they have a firm understanding of how insurance payouts are going to go to these individ individuals that were impacted by the fires. So really it's, it's been the general effect of the damage from this fire has been really borne by local charities, uh, especially here with the San Diego Memorial Hospital and the San Diego Integration Team has done a lot in order to help the families that are directly impacted by these fires. One of the things that we're seeing right now, and I, and I believe it's textbook, is six months or seven months after a huge traumatic event like this, we're seeing a lot of people bring up mental health issues. Um, in particular, we have had about eight employees in the last two weeks asked for additional people to talk to and therapists. So we're reaching out to, to help out our employees who have obviously experienced a huge loss here locally. So as a company, we have invested significantly into this local region. As I mentioned before, a few of the constraints that we really experience are labor, um, but actually resource as well. We, we fight intensely in order to maintain the resources to come into our mill, the timber supply to keep us operating on, on a uh, firm basis. So we have invested significantly into advanced robotics. Uh, this is not really to reduce our headcount, but to really make the jobs of the people that work for us much easier and much more attractive so that we can keep and attract people. In addition, we, uh, First Lumber Company has patented and developed a mass timber panel for mass timber construction for multi-story structures. Our intent is that with mass timber, wood products can be a direct uh, comparison against steel and concrete structures and show that, that we can be a very environmentally sustainable material. So we all know the carbon cycle. We understand that trees breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. And they take that carbon and they build up their cellular structure with it. And when we take that, those trees and we turn them into a usable product within the building, that it sequesters that carbon for the lifetime of the structure. And then when we replant the trees after their harvest, then we are sequestering carbon again in the future. We look at mass timber as our avenue to open up the eyes of the architects, engineers, consumers, and developers of the world to say that wood is good and what is the most environmentally responsible material that we could use as a society in order to build our multi-story structures of the future. So in conclusion, I just wanna say thank you again to Starker. Thank you to Oregon State University for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tyler. We appreciate your comments. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, if you have questions, uh, we'll be addressing those at the end. So uh, you can continue to put those in the Q&A and, and we'll be uh, dealing with some of those towards the end today. Our next speaker is Mr. Kelly Wise. He joined Roseburg in October, 2012 as Vice President of Human Resources and Labor Relations. He began working with wood products companies in 1983 spending 24 years with TOC Management Services as a labor and employment attorney. During that time, Kelly provided assistance to Roseburg Forest Products in management training, labor relations, and employment issues. Just prior to joining Roseburg, Kelly worked for HR Answers. He has assisted both public and private sector Pacific Northwest employers with labor negotiations and relations, human resources issues, management training, executive coaching, 
and legal compliance. He has spoken extensively to employers up and down the West Coast on a broad range of leadership and management topics. Kelly was formerly an adjunct professor at Portland State University. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree in journalism from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and his Doctor of Jurisprudence from the University of Oregon. Help me join, join me in welcoming Kelly. All right, thank you, Tammy. I'm, I'm assuming my stuff is up on the screen and ready to go. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and, and thanks for giving me the chance to talk to you all this afternoon. Um, I loved hearing what Tyler had to share. I think you're gonna hear a lot of similarities with Roseburg. Uh, one of the things that I'm proud about our industry, and you've got clear, clearly got that message from Tyler's comments is, we're very resilient as an industry, and we're also very resilient with our with our team members, with the workforce we have. And, and that was something we saw over and over last year as we went through first the COVID piece, which is still ongoing, and as well as the uh, Archie Creek fire, which is the fire I'll discuss as well. So a little bit about Roseburg. Is, uh, Roseburg is a closely held ownership company. We're actually family owned and have been that way since we started in 1937 when Kenneth Ford started the company. We've now expanded extensively, still owned by the Ford family. We are an integrated company, meaning we own timber as well as operations throughout the United States. And a lot of our timber feeds those operations. We have 15 operations. Um, and again, we're diversified in what we do. We have a sawmill, we have plywood operations, we have composite uh, plants. We also have engineered wood. And we actually have a shipping terminal out at Coos Bay where we ship chips to the Far East. So heavily integrated, um, starting to spread even more. We have 3,400 team members across the United States and now also in Canada. So we have an international footprint. And so while our footprint is larger and we face broader or more complex issues from a state or geographic standpoint, a lot of the things that Tyler described we saw at each of our operations, especially dealing with COVID. And then we also in Timberland in Oregon and out in the Roanoke area of Virginia and North Carolina. So again, we've expanded our footprint. So when COVID broke, it was just about a year ago, uh, actually this week, I remember because we first put out our response plan March 10th of 2020. It was a 10 page response plan. Our intent was to, to provide something to keep people working while we assess what the impact was gonna be. That 10 page plan is now over 40 pages long and frankly, it's continuing to grow. Um, initially, the first four or five months of COVID, it grew weekly, um, it slowed down a little bit, but one of the things we're starting to see now is as different states start to back off on face covering requirements. We saw that with uh, Texas and Mississippi, we're seeing expanding two or three more states in the next few weeks. As states adjust where we're located, we have to adjust as well, and that modifies that plan. Our commitment, frankly, was that we were gonna operate safely. So early on, we assessed what we saw with COVID. As Tyler mentioned, the markets were good at the time. We didn't know initially if that would continue or not. Roseburg made the decision to run. We felt that we had the team in place, the opportunities that we were gonna run, now we'd make that made a weekly assessment on what we would operate, but we kept full operations going. We felt there was a balance that we could achieve. One of the things we did early on is we did look at places where we might need to curtail. We looked at a reduction in force and we looked at furloughs and we went through the planning process just to be prepared of looking at a furlough in several hundred people. We're teed up to do that. And frankly, we decided that it wasn't worth the impact on our people. If we were gonna operate, we wanted to fully operate the best we could and having people share shifts or share jobs didn't fit who we are. So we did not furlough anybody. We did go through a brief, our small reduction in force out of 3,400 folks, we did reduce our workforce by 50 folks, primarily in positions where we had duplication on the administrative side of the business. So we did take that step up front but then we jumped into COVID and our approach with COVID has been what we call managed compliance. What we mean by that is we'll see what the law says, but then we have to assess how it fits who we are and what we do. So when we look at face covering requirements, social distancing, now the testing processes that have come out, we really look at 
what we can do to manage that compliance to allow us to operate safely. And that's worked for us. We have a company-wide plan, but one of the things we learned last year is one size doesn't fit all. So that plan is tweaked or slightly adjusted for different states or for Canada based on specific requirements. So it's a nice comprehensive plan, but the reality is when you get into COVID on a state by state basis, there's nuances that we have to worry about. The other piece we committed to up front is we were gonna communicate and educate and inform our folks. We felt that was critical. If you remember when COVID first hit with the different stories going on, what was happening, what was not happening, we saw our workforce respond with a lot of fear and confusion. Excuse me, we wanted to make sure that we were taking steps and keeping them educated. A couple of pictures are on the screen just to show you some simple steps we took to be prepared. So you can see the uh, by the time clock in one of our plants, the floor was marked for six feet, even on the back of hard hat. Simple steps that helped our workforce become comfortable with working while we were going through the initial steps of COVID. So the workforce impact, as I mentioned, we had a lot of confusion and fear. One of the things that we realized early on is that there was no way in the world we could keep up with social media. It just simply moved too fast with stories on COVID, on, on what to do, what not to do. There was conflict between different medical uh, professionals. And so we said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what CDC requires, we're gonna look at what the states say, and we're gonna communicate directly with our crew. One of the things we found right up front, and, and Tyler alluded to this, we saw inconsistent attendance. Um, and you know the challenge of that for us was because we committed to keep operating, we kept, we've kept operating at 100% capacity, is what do we do when we have people gone? So we had people working in unfamiliar jobs, which is a challenge from a safety standpoint, it's a challenge from a quality production standpoint. But one of the things we realized is our people wanted to keep working. So as, as our workforce wanted to keep working, those that showed up every day, we wanted to provide the best opportunity. So we did a lot of cross training, uh, a lot of opportunities for people to work additional shifts, which is an overtime issue. There's an added cost to that, but we felt it was worth, worth it to keep that production going. And again, markets turned better, which was beneficial. But early on, there was a lot of question about that. We wanted to structure ourselves as best we could, and that's what we've done. I will uh, comment, Tyler mentioned the hard to hire piece. That is an issue. It's not limited to Oregon. We see that in other parts of the country as well. And it's going to be an ongoing challenge. We see it in Douglas County, where Roseburg's located. And it's something I think we'll continue to have to push on. And technology helps with some of that, uh, trying to find things that are attractive trying to find creative ways to get people to move to small communities will, will also benefit that. Again, if you've watched what happened the last year, there's a trend. So they say of people moving to small communities, we're not seeing it yet in Roseburg. We hope to, but all of our plants are located in rural communities and that's gonna be a challenge for us. So again, our approach was to communicate, show steps, continue to operate and then communicate more. And we looked at a variety of communications we wanted to keep our team members engaged. Our safety performance actually improved in total for 2020, which was surprising to us. I think people got more sensitive to safety issues as they work different jobs, but we actually saw our workers' comp costs and our days away from work, which is a workers' comp measurement, decrease over the course of 2020. One of the things that we did was with our, with our crews is we put out a weekly PowerPoint slide simply on a revolving cycle at each of our mills. And it tells them specifically what's going on with COVID on a national basis. And then we show them the Roseburg numbers. So we show them every week what plants are experienced from the standpoint of cases reported and of positives. So it gave them an assurance as far as understanding, okay, this is how critical it is. And it's not blown out of proportion. We're managing it. The results we had. So over the course of 2020, we lost less than 40 hours to COVID directly tied to being on plant site. What I mean by that is when we had a reported potential COVID exposure on site, we got very good at separating the person, quarantining off the area. We actually, we actually brought in commercial cleaners, that is commercial cleaning machines, 
where we could be responsive. We trained our safety staff how to use those, so it allowed production to continue. So we were pleased with that. That was a great result for us. Um, it was a challenge to, to keep employees comfortable that just because there was a report of COVID didn't mean it was a positive. As you can see by the next bullet down on the slide, through the course of 2020, we had 1,060 reported cases. Within those reported cases, only 114 uh, team member positives. So it's a really small percentage. Now I will tell you, since the end of uh, 2020, we have seen a blip. It was kind of anticipated after the holidays that there would be a blip in, in reported cases and actually positives. We're now at just over 1,400 reported cases. We're up to about 165 positives, which is just under 5% of the workforce. And again, to us, the, the, the challenge was dealing with the reported cases in a way that people could keep working. And if we had a positive, learning how to track that positive so we can ensure nobody else got exposed or those that had been exposed, what could we do about that? And one of the challenges that we had as we worked with our workforce was, was as they had concerns, if they didn't get the response they liked, or if there was a response um, that didn't fit what they were might have been reading elsewhere, what would they do about it? So we actually had 16 different OSHA com uh, complaints filed last year, all COVID related. Out of those 16, we had zero citations. It was, it was a great result. One of the things we learned from that is every time we got an OSHA complaint, we'd look at what was behind it and build an education communication around that. So it would happen to do with face coverings. We'd, re we'd reinforce the need to wear face coverings and how to do so. If it had to do with failure to clean after, after operating a machine, we would reinforce that piece. So it gave us a chance, even in addressing those complaints to further educate the crew. And we found they were responsive to it. Building the education allowed them to gain comfort that we were doing things safely and we were gonna to continue to do that. Our commitment uh, also opened up other operations we saw not only the automation piece, the cross training that I mentioned earlier, um, and frankly, it opened up markets as we saw other wood product employers not operate or operate a different direction than they had in the past. It did give us a chance and it made it a good year for us. Challenging year, especially when we start throwing the other pieces in like the fire, the social injustice issues that cropped up, but it did give us a, a very positive year. And again, to us, that's a reflection of the workforce. A majority of our folks wanted to come to work last year. So our lessons learned, as I mentioned, one size doesn't fit all. You have to be able to adjust by site, sometimes by department. And, and we got good at being flexible. So you have an umbrella policy, an umbrella approach, but there are things you have to be ready to deal with relative to being in South Carolina or Ontario, Canada or Missoula, Montana. So it's continual refinement of our response process. Our safety staff, our HR staff, frankly, work 24 seven because we're 24 seven operation, a lot of facilities and COVID would crop up at all different times. Phone calls, issues regarding exposure. Um, as Tyler mentioned, a lot of issues regarding childcare or family care. And we wanted to be responsive to each of those. And so we built up a pretty good communication and tracking system to make that happen. We had a lot of collaboration and, and, and our collaboration really is focused on balancing what is our legal obligation to stay in compliance, but how do we manage the specific situation? How do we keep people working? We actually saw our paid sick leave use here in Oregon go down last year, which is, is pretty remarkable. And you think people had access to 40 hours of paid sick leave, take it for a variety of different reasons that would be COVID related, and we actually saw that decrease, which again is a testimony of our people wanting to continue to work. So our next phase, one of the issues that we see going forward is COVID is not gonna go away. As vaccinations start to pick up and we see the increased population getting vaccinated, there will still be issues that we see are gonna occur. There are reasons legally and practically why some people are not gonna to wanna to get vaccinated. Um, there are gonna be people that are just put it off. And so we're dealing with that as much as we can. And again, it's, it's almost a day-to-day -day exercise. There's increased complexity of different, different issues regarding hiring people. That's not going to go away. I think one of the challenges we have in this state is, is 
In 2023, Oregon paid sick leave increases to 12 weeks of paid leave per year versus the 40 it is now. And if COVID is still around impacting workers or their families, the challenge is going to be how do you manage that increased amount of paid sick leave, not only from the cost standpoint of providing it, but really the cost standpoint of replacing it and keep, okay, people, keeping uh, people continuing working, keeping your operations going. The other piece that came out of COVID at the end of last year was in Oregon, COVID became a potential workers' comp claim. And when that happened, it changed how we had to track things. We have not seen a claim yet for a work-related COVID uh, exposure, which would qualify for workers' comp, but it's out there, which means that anytime there's a report of COVID, we have extensive tracking in place so we know the details in case it does fall over into the workers' comp piece. One of our concerns, and, and I'll touch on this when we talk about Archie Creek as well, is, is seeing certain agencies, in this case, OROSHA, um, looking to self-initiate certain activities from a regulatory standpoint. OROSHA made some efforts at that last year. Our industry got active and pushing back on some of that. They kicked it off. That was a good thing. We're seeing that start to crop up again, and, and it's going to be a challenge because all it does is increase the complexity of work of, of working here in Oregon and of our ability to operate. I'll touch on an example of that when we talk Archie Creek. So we've taken a pretty proactive response as things have developed. We, we look at rapid testing. We actually brought rapid testing on site two weeks ago. Uh, we were able to acquire a, a supply of what I call the MBA rapid testing tests. So the same type of rapid testing they use in the MBA where if an employee calls in with COVID exposure, at our discretion, we can have them drive into the plant, not get out of their car. We, ha we have somebody hand them the test kit through the window. They do their own swab, pop it in a vial, and in 20 minutes, we know whether they're positive or negative. So it's an opportunity to keep our folks working. Frankly, it helps us manage the attendance side, which helps their team members, our teammates also continue to work. That'll continue as that testing improves. Um, it's, it's not cheap but it's really effective. And we've seen examples already where shifts have been able to operate versus not being able to because of a COVID or potential COVID exposure that turns out to be negative. The face coverings piece, again, is changing almost daily. You're gonna see that over the next few weeks. One of the things that we've, we've already determined is, is that as certain states where we're located drop their face covering requirements in those states, we'll drop the face covering requirements. I don't foresee that for Oregon for, for several months at the earliest, but where we can, we will make that happen based on the state requirement. So again, we're looking at what we can do to keep our folks working safely, but also protect them from this, the COVID piece. The vaccine piece, one of the things that, that is developed is as the vaccinations occur, there's a post period where there's, there's uh, protection so they can keep working even with limited exposure where it's only minor symptoms. We haven't seen that in this state yet because we haven't seen it at our operational level. When that hits, again, people that get vaccinated have this built-in period following their second vaccine where they'll be able to work even with limited exposure or mild symptoms. Great way for us to uh, also keep folks at, uh, at, in the mills. So that's the COVID piece. Um, it was complex. It's, it's actually more complex this year. Flipping gears uh, a little bit or switching gears a little bit. The other piece we faced last year was the Archie Creek fire. Fire was just east of Glide and Sutherland, so east, northeast of our operations. It was our fifth catastrophic fire in the last, last eight years. Uh, that frequency is a concern. Roger will probably touch on that during his presentation but it does, it does create concerns as far as how often is this gonna to happen to this degree. Archie Creek was huge. One of the things that we've learned over the previous fires the last several years is making sure we have people properly trained. So our entire resources team, the logging contractors we use all go through annual fire training. In this case, that was critical. The reason it was critical is as Roger mentioned, state and federal fire teams we're stretched, stretched so bad dealing with fires up north um, or out of state that we couldn't get a lot of state and federal assistance. Actually, we got no state and federal assistance up front. And so what we did was we put our folks out there along with some large local contractors to start building fire breaks. And we've learned that 
if you can get those fire breaks built in the first day, day and a half, you have a great chance of isolating the fire. So it was a lesson learned over the last several years. Last year, it really came home to, to, to roost when we saw what happened with Archie Creek. That doesn't mean it, it helped with the overall impact. We lost 20,000 acres, which is roughly 125 million board feet. So very significant. Our young timber was burnt. It's not going to be recoverable. However, we do expect that we'll get about a 90% recovery of our merchantable timber, some of, some of the older stuff. The good news is because of building access early, we were able to get in and start recovering right away. As of today, as you can see, we've got 50% recovery, about 60 million board feet. On the average, we run about 180 log trucks a day in and out trying to pull out as much of that timber and salvage as much as we can. It's the young timber that we won't be able to recover. The impact on us is at least a two year reforestation process. And, and we'll work on that piece at the same time we're trying to salvage. So what's ahead for us? Um, from, a, from a timber standpoint, we're continuing to assess what we do with our timber lands. How can we build better protection? Are there options out there for, for building better protection where we can? We are dealing with some state and federal issues that we need to, uh, that we're going to continue to face. Uh, the one I mentioned is, is the Ore Ocean one for this year will be dealing with smoke and fire hazard and the potential of an emergency rule. But the flip side is we think with the workforce we've got, with the, the, what we learned last year from a creativity standpoint, from an execution standpoint, even as we assess how we go forward, there are a lot of opportunities out there. We'll just have to address the risks as they occur. So wrapping up with that, Tammy, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Kelly, for that presentation. Again, if you have questions, uh, you can enter them into the Q&A and we'll have some time to address those uh, shortly. Our next speaker and our final speaker in this panel is Mr. Roger Lord. Uh, Mr. Lord is the president of Mason, Bruce and Gerard Natural Resource Consultants, a multidisciplinary firm specializing in forestry, environmental sciences and geospatial consulting. Roger is a professional forester with more than 30 years of experience in timberland valuation and investment analysis, forest economics and policy analysis, fiber supply analysis and forest management planning. Before joining Mason, Bruce and Gerard in 2004, Roger held forest economics and planning positions with Boise Cascade Corporation from 1995 to 2004 and the Texas Forest Service from 1985 to 1995. Roger received a bachelor's degree in forest science and a master's degree in forest resources and operations, operations research from the Penn State University. He is a member of the Association of Consulting Foresters, a member of the Society of American Foresters, and a practicing affiliate of the Appraisal Institute. Welcome, Roger. All right, thank you, Tammy. Uh, my screen look okay? I guess it, yeah, I'm a, all right, we're good. All right, well, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today about the impacts of the 2020 wildfires. Uh, most of what I'm gonna present today comes from a preliminary study that uh, Mason, Bruce, and Gerard did uh, with um, Forest Economics Advisors. Uh, to try to assess the, uh, the extent of the damages and the economic impacts that they'll have over the, over the coming years. Um, given the time limits here, uh, this will be a pretty high level uh, presentation focusing mainly on identifying uh, the acres that were lost and, and characterizing them and, and also the volume lost. Um, but uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, we are starting an expanded study that is funded by OFRI, the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, to uh, take a, a, a closer look at these questions and uh, incorporate more, uh, especially on the small non-industrial private and the public sector sides than we were able to do in our preliminary study. That uh, report should be uh, coming out at the end of June. So we're, we're quite uh, happy to be uh, doing that uh, to, to help the forest sector sort of understand what the future impacts will be. I want to start off with a little context. Um, of course, I think we're all aware that 
uh, wildfires seem to be on the increase, uh, and the data does point that out very, very um, clearly. Um, nationally, in fact, three of the five worst fire years that we've had since 1960 on a na nationwide basis have been in the last six years. And actually, as I look at this graph, three of the three worst fire years have been since in the last six years. So 2015, 2017, and 2020 were all the three worst years and, and each of them um, covered at least 10,000 acres. So obviously we're, we're, in a, we're in a trend here and we're, we're quite concerned as, as Kelly said about how long this will persist. Um, this graph is a little bit dated, uh, but it shows where the increases in fire have been occurring by comparing the 15 year period between 1984 and 1999 with uh, the 15 years between 2000 and 2014. And the, 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 the red states, Idaho and Oregon, have seen the most percentage increase in acreage burned over that time period. So, so we're certainly in the crosshair in Oregon, and I was a little bit surprised that California wasn't up there, but um, that this is the data at, as of that period of time. Um, in fact, most Western states that have forest cover have seen the, the most severe fire seasons basically in the last decade. Idaho had its worst fire season since the 1910 fires in 2012. Um, Colorado, Oregon, and California all had their worst fire seasons uh, in, in recent memory um, in 2000. So quite concerning. Um, turning to uh, 2020 in Oregon, we had over a million acres burned statewide. But what was really unique about uh, 2020 was that 800 and almost 830,000 acres burned in Western Oregon. Traditionally, the, the wetter part of the state with long fire return intervals. So nine counties um, had fires in them, 20, 20 fires, most of those starting in the Labor Day weekend. And, and um, very uniquely, five fires over 100,000 acres. And uh, this is just a couple of landscape shots of a, of a couple of the fires. The, uh, on the left, the Archie Creek fire, which Kelly talked about, uh, burned um, near Glide, just uh, northeast of Roseburg in Douglas County, encompassed 130,000 acres. And then uh, on the right is a uh, picture of the Beachy Creek fire, which uh, Tyler talked about in the Santa Ann Canyon, burned in uh, Marion Lynn and Clackamas County and, and totaled over 190,000 acres. This next picture is a, a before and after picture of a kind of a landmark down in Douglas County, the uh, Taylor Creek Cliff. Uh, taken before and after the Archie Creek fire. And you, you can see uh, the completeness of the Archie Creek fire burn. So this graph um, shows the size of the, the uh, 20 fires in Oregon, the largest being the Beachy Creek fire. And um, the, the, the six or seven, well, the five fires over 100,000 acres and then the uh, smaller fires. In, in total, the acreage within all of these fire perimeters represents six, over 6% 6 of uh, timberland in Western Oregon. So that's a pretty significant percentage of our, our timberland base in, in Western Oregon, for sure. Uh, turning to our estimation of losses, uh, we focused on six fires, the, uh, the five, call them mega fires over 100,000 acres. Um, and then we also threw in the South Open Chain Fire, which is about a 33,000 acre fire. But we included it because it's, it's still within the sort of the core timber shed of Western Oregon and, and, and could have a significant impact on timber supplies in that part of the uh, country. That's in Northern Jackson County. Um, so we included that total of 745,000 acres, about 90% of all 20 fires. So we're looking at the, the bulk of the acreage losses. 
So in, in order to estimate the losses, we uh, first overlaid the uh, US Forest Service fire per perimeters, uh, which are GIS shapefile layers um, as of October 1st. So this was after most of the fires had been um, controlled and weren't spreading any further. Uh, we overlaid those, uh, those perimeters on tax parcel uh, data from the counties and from that pulled out a uh, classification of ownership. In large, uh, large private uh, owners owning at least 3000 acres, small private, smaller than that, and then state and um, federal, tribal and so forth. Um, and then we used a, a remote sensing analysis to classify the acres within the perimeters into three very broad age classes. Um, the, the youngest age class included unplanted stands or recent clear cuts up through about eight years old. So young uh, plantations prior to crown closure, basically. Um, second age class, uh, age nine to 34 years, we called that the pre merchantable age class, and then merchantable uh, 35 plus. Um, and then we also netted down, um, taking the gross acres, we netted down to eliminate um, some, some urban areas along highway corridors, um, towns, and some agricultural areas, other non forest acreage. Uh, we eliminated estimates of riparian and road buffers. Um, not that those didn't burn, but they're, we're trying to get at really what the net productive acreage loss was. And so we excluded those. And then finally, we, uh, we used some data, which I'll show in a moment, to uh, look at the fire severity and try to, try to eliminate those acres that were not um, significantly damaged um, by the fires. And then uh, we also, once we had the acreage, um, we estimated volumes based on average stocking by ownership and age class. And we, we drew that data from a variety of sources. We think it's a, a reasonable estimate of the volume that was uh, in those, on those acres. So this is the, uh, the uh, map for the Archie Creek fire. The US Forest Service does a uh, process after these major fires called the Rapid Assessment of Vegetation Condition After Wildfire or RAVAGE. Um, and they look at several different parameters, basal area mortality uh, and several other things. But one of them that, that seemed to tie uh, most directly to uh, the fire damages was the crown canopy loss. And uh, we, we took a close look at this, did some field reconnaissance and talked to the Forest Service experts and de determined that if the, if the crown canopy damage was more than 25%, uh, it's basically a stand replacing fire, which means it's a complete loss. It's, it's not something that you would wanna maintain and uh, continue through the rotation. So if it's, if it's over 35 years and some, years old and sometimes maybe down to age 30, you want, uh, you want to try to salvage the, uh, the timber that's available on there. Um, you probably want to do some kind of site rehabilitation to get the site ready for replanting. And then you want to do, uh, you want to do reforestation, replanting, direct seeding or something like that. So in, in this map, the, uh, the red portion of the RT Creek fire is the area that where the canopy, the crown canopy loss was more than 25%. And you can see there, that was a very intense burn, uh, especially in the center of the fire. There was not much left in there for miles and miles, but out on the edges, there was some uh, areas where the stands were more lightly touched or, or maybe untouched at all. So our focus is just on the red area there, which for the Archie Creek fire was a significant percentage of the, of the total acres. Um, not all fires burn this completely. That, this is probably an, an example of the, uh, the high end in terms of, of burn intensity. The uh, Riverside fire, for example, burn, burned in much more of a mosaic pattern. Um, you can see the green there is where the canopy uh, loss was less than 25%. And so, so you can see there was a, low, a lower percentage of uh, stand replacing fire uh, losses on this fire. This is something that we're going to revisit in the OFRI study. Uh, we used uh, 
satellite uh, imagery or the Forest Service used satellite imagery that was taken right after the fire. Uh, one thing we noticed was there was a lot of, uh, as we went out to the field, there were a lot of trees that still had brown needles in the crowns that hadn't fallen. And a lot of times we observed that those were counted as or, or considered live crowns in the uh, Forest Service analysis. We're, we're thinking that if we uh, take a look at satellite imagery that's a little bit uh, later after the fire, we might see um, that maybe there's more acreage will show up as complete loss as those needles drop. So uh, this graph shows the total acreage um, of all of those six fires uh, by ownership. So the green is the gross acres in that ownership within the fire perimeter. And then the, uh, the brown or orange bar is the net acreage of severe damage with, with all of those um, subtractions taken out. Across all fires, about 69% of the gross acreage was classified as severely burned. And that varied by fire. The RT Creek fire was a, was a much higher percentage. Riverside fire was, was lower, than, lower than average. So what does that look like in terms of age class distribution? If, if you look across all ownerships, um, 500 and about 515,000 acres or 69% of the, of the gross acreage was classified as severely damaged, um, stand replacing. Of that, about 52% was in our merchantable age class category, uh, about 270,000 acres. And, and on that, we estimate the average stocking or, or the total uh, volume would, would be 8.9 billion board feet. Um, which if you compare that to the average uh, west side Oregon timber harvest over the last five years is about two and a half years worth of harvest for the entire left, uh, west side. So very large volume. Um, 7.3% or 7.3 billion board feet of that is on federal lands, US Forest Service and BLM. So a lot of that merch timber is, is on federal lands. Um, Turning to the other age classes, 31% um, of, uh, of the severely damaged acreage, uh, 160,000 acres was in the pre-merch age class from nine to 34 years. And then an, another about 85,000 acres or 17% was in recent clear cuts up until up through eight year old stands. So that's kind of the breakdown when you look at all ownerships. But uh, more interesting for, from the standpoint of future timber supply is to look at the private sector. And uh, this graph focuses on large private, um, which is again, ownerships of more than 3000 acres. Uh, on, this ownership, on this ownership class, 194,000 acres uh, or, or about 73% of their ownership was severely damaged, damaged enough to require salvage and reforestation. Uh, we estimate uh, 1.2 billion board feet on these acres based on our average stocking assumptions for uh, large private ownerships. Um, that 1.2 is about 35% of the average Western Oregon harvest. Um, if we're able to, for example, salvage 65% of that, that would be about a, a quarter of the uh, average harvest on the west side in, a, in an average year. Still a significant amount of volume. It's about 780 uh, million board feet. Uh, if you can salvage 65, per, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 65% of that 1.2 billion board feet. So turning towards sort of what, what is the, the um, feat that uh, is before us that we need to accomplish and able to get those acres back into production. Um, if we look at salvage uh, acreage first, um, if, if, if we were to salvage across all ownerships, there's about 270,000 acres that need to be um, or, or eligible for salvage. If you just look at the private lands, it's about 60, almost 61,000 acres of salvage 
opportunity or salvage potential. Um, in these stands, if you, if you don't get in there and salvage before the uh, wood deteriorates, which we think now is probably, um, ex probably you can salvage through the end of 2021 and possibly for the dug fir into um, May, June of 2022, that's about the time window that you have before the wood deteriorates to the point where it's just not economical to, to use. If you're not able to salvage those acres, then you're going to have to go in and do some type of land clearing to, to drop the trees and reestablish uh, a, a forest underneath. And that's quite expensive. So private landowners are really incented to get as much salvage acreage done as possible so that that site's ready to replant. Um, the, the real problem or the harder hurdle is what do you do with the stuff that's nine to, to 30 or 34 years old? There's not enough merchantable volume to make an econo economical sale. So, you, but you've got to do something to get rid of those trees. Uh, and that might range from uh, a land clearing operation, probably more on the flatter ground where it's easier to just um, leaving the, leaving the uh, burn trees standing and interplanting uh, seedlings underneath those. And I know a lot of landowners are experimenting with different ways to deal with those acres. Um, probably the easiest stuff to do, and that's about, that's almost 100,000 acres of that just on private lands. The easier stuff to deal with is the zero to eight years, because for the most part, you can probably do some site preparation and just go in and replant those without much additional expense. But that's 70,000 acres and still a lot of acres to cover. Um, I'm not addressing the, the state and federal. I know the state, uh, Sandy Am Forest has a, has a plan. Uh, initially, I think they were talking about salvaging four to 5,000 acres and, and more recently, I hear they're backing down from that. Um, we'll see where that goes. The federal uh, ownerships are a real guess as to what they'll be able to do, but you know our, our history with that is they, they haven't been able to do much uh, to, get, to get any salvage done before the wood deteriorates. That's, as, as Kyle said, that's a major worry for the surrounding landowners as well as the surrounding communities. Um, reforestation needs uh, Oregon, according to OFRI, typically plants about 40 million seedlings in a typical year. Um, if we were, uh, well, we know we're going to have to reforest this. And um, if you just look at the, uh, the private ownership, um, we need a lot more seedlings and we need them here pretty quick. Um, incrementally, and this is incremental to our baseline 40 million seedlings because there is still green timber harvesting going around on the state. And we've got these, these new acres layered on top. So we need between somewhere between, uh, if you just look at private and state on this bottom row here, somewhere between 72 million seedlings and 100 million plus seedlings produced in the next two to three years, ideally. Um, there has been, there is some experimentation going on. Most seedlings are two year stock. So they're at the nursery two years before they get out planting. I know some owners are experimenting with uh, out planting one-year-old uh, seedlings, hoping that would essentially double um, uh, nursery production. And then I know Weyerhaeuser and the uh, state are experimenting with direct seeding from helicopters, at least on some of the tougher ground to see if they can get uh, seedlings established there. Um, Long-term impacts. Uh, definitely are going to be some long-term impacts on future timber supply. We, we basically have an age class gap of more than five. We've created an age class gap of 500,000 acres that will be set back to zero uh, and replanted in the ne next few years. That, the, that's timber that would have been harvested over the next 40 years. So we've got about a 40 year hole in our age class distribution. If you just look at private and state lands alone, it's about 240,000. So uh, definitely will be an impact on, on supplies spread out across the geographies. This will affect our future timber prices and supplies. It'll affect our regional competitiveness of the forestry sector as our costs go up relative to other, set, other regions of the US. 
ultimately that'll impact our, our state and regional economies and particularly our, our rural economies that are very dependent on, on uh, the timber resource. And then uh, other long-term impacts, we're already getting questions from timberland investors about um, are we ad adequately considering, or they are they ad adequately considering the, the higher risk that it's in, that's inherent in owning forest land, uh, both in the South, where they've experienced a few years of really bad hurricane damage on some investment timberland, but also in California and Pacific Northwest with these fires. So we're hearing in quick, increasing questions about climate change, fire risk, and adaptive management. And we may see some investors at least pulling back on uh, their interest in timberland investment. They, that may affect uh, timberland values and uh, in just, just the interest in investing in timberland. But I wanted to end up with, on a positive note. Uh, I think just listening to Kelly and Tyler, uh, I, I have no doubt that the forest sector and Oregonians will rise to the occasion and we will get these hills uh, turning green again, and uh, we will get these acres back uh, back in production in the private private lands. Um, I hope we can work on the public lands and, and get them moving in the same direction. But it's already amazing how much has been how much has been going on as Tyler and Kelly talked about. I was out on a fire within three weeks of the, the fire. There were already fresh seedlings in the ground. There's there's a lot of work being done and a lot of people uh, all in on getting these lands back in production. And with that, I'll, I'll quit. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Roger. So now we're going to have some time for some questions. Thank you for everyone who has submitted some questions for our panelists today. And so I will bring everybody back up. And um, so um, we've got some great questions. And I'm going to do a little bit of lumping and, and, and see kind of perspectives uh, from whoever would like to answer. Um, so obviously, we're going to ask the big, the big one first, right? So I know you don't have a crystal ball. But do you think wood products prices will remain high beyond 2021? And that's for whoever is brave enough. I, you know, I might jump in on this one because I, I, I love wood products markets and, you know, we get a little bit wonky about it sometimes. I, you know, I, I think part of the question we should ask is why are prices so high in the first place? Um, number one, our historical 50 year average prior to 2008 for housing starts was about 1.5 million housing starts as combined between multifamily and single family. Since 2010, we have really struggled to hit a million. We hit 1.2 million sometime around 2018. So this year, well, in beginning of 2020 was the first time that they, they thought we'd get about 1.4 million housing starts. So over 10 years, the industry has essentially adjusted to the volume of orders that we potentially have for housing starts. So we're, we're just not quite ready for 1.5 million starts. Um, and obviously with COVID restrictions, reduced production from that, uh, it's really created a supply chain problem. And I, and I think it's even visible with Amazon where they went from one day delivery to two week delivery. It's kind of the same thing for the, the wood products industry especially when we buy timber on long-term contracts. The other thing I would really like people to keep in mind is that the single highest determination of your final pro uh, product price is your raw material price. Um, over, since we have essentially reduced the amount of timber that's available off of federal lands and industrial lands have essentially remained constant over the last 20 years, we've, re we've really experienced a supply constraint, which leads to higher costs of raw materials. So over the last 10 years, the US has started importing large amounts of finished product from South America. So we are, we are making the decision locally to reduce our timber harvest so that we can encourage timber harvest down in South America. And if we're importing 12% from Brazil on an annual basis, I think we all know that Brazil is a huge holder of rainforest. I don't think it does any of the environment any good to replace harvest here with harvest down there. 
we would really much rather see a vibrant timber industry here that's able to weather the ups and downs of the markets than to encourage the large scale importation of foreign products. Great, Kelly or Roger, anything to add? I mean, well, I, I would just add to what Tyler said. I mean, the amount of external factors is increasing. So, you know, he talked about Brazil, the flip side is you look at what's happened in Canada and the number of sawmills that have shut down there over the last few years. Then you look at the, the, the supply issues relative to, to glue and resin, depending on what type of producer you are. So I think those external factors become so complicated, it is gonna drive prices up for a while. You just have to be able to adjust to, to where you can based on how those factors hit you. You know, and if I could add one other thing, uh, and I thank Kelly for bringing that up. The, uh, you know, here locally, we were, we're of course impacted by a fire where 700 residents have burned down 700 homes have burned down and people will see these current high prices of material and they say well the wood products companies must be gouging the locals because everything burned down here locally and nothing could be further from the truth we're a globally traded commodity in fact the majority of our product actually ships up to the northeast of the united states because that's a very plywood loyal market if you use osb in the northwest you're not using a local product. You're using a Canadian or Southeastern product. If you buy plywood in the Northwest, you are using a local product. So you're going from some forest to frame as opposed to trying to import it from foreign countries. Spot on. Great. So uh, another question, and, and Roger, maybe this would be good for you. This I talked a little bit about some of the harvest scheduling and, and you got into a little bit, but the question is, Looking further into the future, what does harvest scheduling look like once all these newly planted trees reach harvest age? Is there going to be a goal of trying to space out age groups to create a more balanced harvest rotation again? Yeah, that's a good question because there's obviously these 100,000 acre areas that are all going to be the same age class. So you've got one thing, you've got the, the, the green up and adjacency constraints that are in the forest you know, forest regulations, you, you've got that. But beyond that, uh, landowners are going to be sort of incented financially to harvest those at about the same time. But, you know, to the extent that it's it's going to be a wall of wood. So it, it will be a very unbalanced situation when those acres come back into production. And yeah, I think they're almost gonna to have to get spread out over time, which means some of those stands will be carried for a lot longer than, than a normal rotation. Yeah, Roger, being from the South, that wall of wood concept we talk about in the South as well, when we had payments that specifically were getting land uh, planted in, in, in these uh, plantations, right? Yeah, well, the conservation reserve plantation spike. Exactly, this is just mother nature's version of that, so. So I've got a whole slew of questions that are very similar that are getting back to um, what happens at the mill, specifically when we've got this damaged wood, uh, just kind of a couple of things. Um, can trees with greater than 20% canopy loss have the same use of quality with undamaged or can it only be used for pulp wood? Um, how does facilitating salvaged timber with a within a mill differ from traditional green timber like waste cost separating process versus so all this kind of what happens when it hits when it hits the mill gate yeah that's that's a great question so the immediate problem that uh, most people don't recognize is it's really a residual problem because we cannot allow charred wood or charred fiber into our residual stream or else we can't sell the chips to paper companies or other secondary producers for the material. So what we need to make sure is that, that the logs that hit our slab are, are not charred into the cam, past the cambium layer of the tree and doesn't lead towards uh, polluted uh, res residual streams. That said, we and Roseburg uh, both have the benefit of having cogeneration facilities in which we have the option to dump our chips if we get black material into it and use that as a fuel stock in order to produce electricity. Uh, for the most part, we believe that the fiber is going to be okay for the next year and a half, maybe two years, uh, but we run density checks uh, continuously because that's the type of material we, send, we sell. And we anticipate there's probably going to be some sort of density loss of the fiber over time as it either is impacted by bugs or con continually deteriorates. Kelly's nodding. 
Yep, well said. <laughs> Great. So I think this also goes uh, probably both uh, to the two mill guys. Uh, what support have your companies made to logging contractors that are damaged by fires and COVID? And that's one of the things we've heard is about uh, some of the, the um, equipment that's been damaged, right? Some of your own may have been damaged. Uh, what kind of support can you do for that part of our community? I'll jump, I'll jump in here. I mean, one of the things that we did was, was that there was some significant uh, equipment loss at the Archer Creek fire. So, so helping them find opportunities for pulling new equipment out of places like uh, Northern Washington, up in Western Canada, looking for opportunities. And, and, you know, there's a mutual benefit in that, obviously, because as we help them locate new equipment, it helps them get in back into the woods to assist us with the salvage operations. And so we work closely with the loggers that we use down in Douglas County to, to look for those kind of opportunities. Yeah, we did the same thing. We're, we uh, we essentially immediately told our loggers that were impacted and lost equipment that not only would we provide the guarantee and low interest loans for the equipment in the first place, but that we would also guarantee their future business here so that they would have consistent business to pay off that equipment. That's great. So we've talked about the salvage. We've talked about how much burned and we talked about it going to the mill and getting it there. Um, one of the questions I hear a lot about is about the reforestation efforts and whether there's going to be enough seedlings and there's this feeling that maybe we're going to run out. Um, can you, anybody address kind of what they know about seedling supply um, in the immediate future? I, I guess I'll go. Um, yeah, the real the real push will be we'll start next year because the seedling supply is what it is for this season and I know companies are moving seedlings around but there are some ex there are folks experimenting as I said with uh, one-year-old seedlings and and you maybe to some extent can plant wider spacings and fewer trees per acre and and then get more acres done the the argument against that is some of these sites these burn sites are really going to be harsh the organic layer is gone and so that that would make you want to plant more trees per acre to, to knowing that you're going to lose some. So it's, it's a tough question, but I know the nurseries are gearing up and everybody is talking about it. So. Yeah. And I, I know that um, Tyler and, and Kelly, the companies um, were planning on buying seedlings and you both mentioned that you were, you were on that right, right away. So great. One of the questions that came up, um, and I've heard this a couple of places as well, is about insurance. Well, all that all that timber was insured. Can we talk a little bit about the insurance and whether whether you actually had it, and uh, is it common for people to have insurance? So, uh, you know, I think Roger touched on this a little bit in his presentation. I think it's an important topic. No, timberland. Uh, is generally not insured. And uh, there are options to potentially insure reproduction or sub 30 year old at a more cost effective rate, but typically mature timberland is not. Uh, the state I believe has an excess liability insurance policy when it hits a certain level, um, it, it will pay out, but that's typically not available to private land. And a lot of the reason is, is that um, insurance companies know how to assess risk and they look at uh, properties adjacent to unmanaged federal land, overstocked federal land as being a risk to private timberland holders, as we can see what happened with uh, with these fires. So it's largely due to a unproductive neighbor that we can't get insurance. Great. Um, so back on the mill end, there was a question about um, the expectation there are probably a lot of larger trees involved in the fires probably coming off of some of the, the public lands. Are there any mills left out there to set up to handle those larger, uh, larger logs? You wanna tackle that one, Kelly? There aren't a lot left. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to think, um, Tyler, who I would mention. Uh, uh, there's some old legacy ones like Whole Oaks and some other people. Uh, you know, for us, we've of course tooled down just like Roseburg has. So our average through our small log facility is only a nine inch average block size. For our large log plant, kind of a misnomer is still only 16 inches for the average block size. 
we can go up to a 40 inch, but, and I believe, I can't remember exactly what the break is that I think it's between 35 and 40 inches. We only get 50 to hundred of those blocks a year. So it's, we, we can, you know, the problem with bigger, older trees is they're kind of like older people. I'm sorry to say this, but we all get aches and pains and knots and neurals and little moldy joints and everything. And so, you know, younger trees are a little more consistent and they grow denser and they're a good product for us to go for. Well, and I, and I think Tyler, the adjustment process of trying to switch and adjust for a larger log, just it slows down overall production, right? So, so it's not only loss of quality, but the production impact can be pretty significant. And I, and I, that's, I was struggling to think of any large log mill still really active. Hulch may be the only one on, on the I-5 border. On hand. Yeah, there's Zippo and, and Hull and maybe a few, but, but not, Herbert. Not, not big, you know, not large capacity. So moving a little bit on to what is probably not our specialization on this panel, um, so there are some questions asked about uh, not the economics, but really um, the growing conditions after this. And if anybody is willing to tackle, um, what other kind of benefits might be happening from these uh, fires that have occurred on the land? Um, do Are there any concerns of site conditions to grow these new stands? Roger said that you know, the ground is going to be a little harsh. Um, and so what do you expect to see afterwards if anybody wants to, to go there? Well, I mean, I, I would say we've got empty land that we need to put trees in. And I mean, it could very well, I mean, frankly, I hadn't thought about that, but it, it could very well impact the growing going forward. Um, but we've got to turn that back into productive forests not only for the wildlife, but for us and our future generations. And we just don't have a choice. Right. All right. So I've got one more. I want to kind of end on a little bit of a, a positive note here, um, I think. Um, you all are in uh, communities, specifically Tyler and Kelly, uh, that were heavily impacted. And so there was a question about whether there are any charities that you know in the area that you would recommend to kind of help the, the people that you serve in your locations uh, in case anybody was interested? Well, there are a variety of local ones. I mean, I couldn't identify them offhand. What we did was um, we actually only had one employee lose their home. So we, we did an internal campaign for that person. And so we did more a lot more time tam of internal uh, giving. Our, our, our team members employees are really good about that piece contributing towards providing this, this, it was actually a single mom and a teenage son, providing the uh, living, living while we were waiting for them to rebuild and do something. But I know Douglas County set up a variety of things. I think Douglas County timber operators, for example, has set up a fund. That's probably the one that's most direct relative to the Roseburg area. Um, beyond that, there's probably a couple more, but usually Douglas County timber operators is, is the one that takes the lead on that for that area. Right. Yeah, the, oh, ahead, Roger. Uh, the the Red Cross has a specific con fund called the Western Wildfire Relief Fund that I know is a, a big one. Um, and then Douglas operators, and I believe there's one in the San Am uh, Canyon as well, just a, a local organization. Yeah, if anyone is interested in helping out the San Am Canyon, I would highly recommend the San Am Canyon Wildfire Relief Fund. It's essentially a fund that's created, but it's administrated uh, by the San Ian Memorial Hospital through the San Ian Integration Team. And it's uh, essentially assorted board members from United Way to local religious charities that have all come together to make sure they don't duplicate their actions, but are most effective with, uh, with helping people impacted in this region. So please consider. Great, thank you so much for giving us that information. Um, we're all thinking about those people that were impacted, so. I want to take it, uh, the moment just to thank you all for participating today, Tyler, Roger, and Kelly. We really appreciate all the information you've given us today and, and really answered some great questions uh, from uh, those who are participating today. Those of you who are out there, I'd like to thank you for attending today, the Starker Lecture Series. Please join us next week for our fourth and final lecture on research, which is going to occur March 10th, 2021. Uh, from 2 o'clock to 3.30, where we will look at how we best study rare disturbances and what we have learned about those disturbances.
The panel will feature Fred Swanson, who is a retired research geologist from the US Forest Service. Dr. Katie Cavanaugh, the Associate Dean of Research at the College of Forestry at OSU. And John Vandalet, the George T. Abel Professor in Infrastructure, Civil and Environmental Engineering at Colorado State University. Thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.